Thank everyone for joining us here to the Northern Nevada Marches Forward dis community discussion about the illusion of inclusion, systemic racism from the lenses of community members, and how it has sparked a movement of Black joy and others like it. We want to talk about some of the systemic issues that we see from a local level and also share with those who have joined us today that are looking at ways that they can make an impact, what they can do to um, be progressive in their community at affecting positive change towards this matter. A uh, little bit about myself, I'm Adrian Feimster, and I am a grassroots community advocate and organizer. I um, also serve as the, on the board of directors here with Northern Nevada Marches Forward. And my family's been in the community about a hundred years. Uh, some of you all may know me from one of my own causes, which is the school naming for the prior, the former Hug Campus uh, that will be converted to a CTE Academy. Um, and I want to go ahead and pass the mic on over to Felicia Weigel, who is the co-host here today as well. Hi, uh, hey, I want to thank everybody for joining. As well, my name is Felicia Weigel. Um, I live here in Reno and have been here since 2017. Um, I graduated from Truckee High School just over the border um, and joined the Navy when I was, you know, and stayed about 10 years as a veteran. Um, I'm also an adoptee and have a, a vested interest in helping advance, um, you know, equal equity and equality in our society and getting rid of systemic racism as we know it. And um, I am also on the board of directors at um, Northern Nevada Marches Forward. And thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you, Felicia. And before we get into the depth of discussion, I want to ask Lance West, uh, if you will, lead us in a land acknowledgement. Now I am about to go. I just want to, uh, how, how, uh, how much? Uh, Lance West, uh, my name is Lance West. I'm an enrolled citizen of Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. And I just want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Paiute, the Shoshone, the Southern Paiute, and the Washoe throughout here in Nevada. And that we honor and respect um, their connection and um, helping with. Uh, retain their knowledge and culture um, that's been passed on by their elders, our elders, um, since time memorial. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lance. And with that, I want to go ahead and open up the discussion to our panelists. We'll have um, our panelists here today introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what motivates you to be involved and what actually prompted you, inspired you to get involved professionally and organizationally. And with that, I'll start this off with Janet Serio. Yes, good evening, everyone. And thank you, um, Adrian. Thank you um, to Northern Nevada Marches Forward for inviting me to serve as a panelist this evening. Um, I am um, going, I have, I wear many hats and I would take me all evening to talk about all of them. So what I'd like to do is just introduce myself as the health committee chair for the Reno Sparks branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Um, for those who might not know, the NAACP is, was founded in 1909 and is the nation's oldest and foremost civil rights organization. The NAACP believes that everyone has a right to health and well being, but America's promise has fallen short. Individual health does not exist in a vacuum. It is tied to the community conditions in which we are born, grow, where we grow, live, work, and age. For people of color, geography, and income, and race are long standing predictors of health outcomes. The roots of historic inequality run very deep and is very fragmented in public and private health systems. The mission of the NAACP is to ensure equal political, educational, social, and economic rights for all persons and to eliminate race based discrimination. 
This mission includes a focus on the right of African Americans and other people of cover to color to have optimal health outcomes and access to timely, quality, affordable health care. So my purpose here tonight will be to talk about the NAACP's commitment to ending racial health disparities and the historic commitment to closing the gap in health disparities across the nation towards that goal of uh, um, obtaining health equity in the uh, United States and globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet, for that introduction. And I wanna move on over to Monique Norman. Oops, I think, can y'all hear me, see me, all that? <laughs> okay, uh, so my name is Monique. Um, I don't know how to follow that up, Janet, that was awesome. <laughs> Um, let's see, uh, my, my main position is I am um, a licensed social worker uh, here in um, Nevada. I'm originally from Vegas. I currently live in Reno. Um, I also wear many hats. I am on the board of NEPCIS, which is the Northern Nevada Black Culture Awareness Society. I'm also on the board of the Great Basin Resource Watch, was, which is um, an environmental agency here. Um, uh, trying to help people, and then also um, Nevada Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Um, and I guess to answer your other question, what motivates me, um, I think just to see change happen, um, to see change happen. And um, of course, I'm not going to, to cause equity to happen, but um, those, are the, those are the things that uh, motivate me. So thank you all for having me. I think you're on mute. I am, thank you. Thank you so much, Monique, that was great. And I wanna ask Mercedes Krauss to tell us about what inspired you, what you do professionally and organizationally to be involved. If you can hear us, Mercedes, you're on mute. All right, I'm gonna move on over to Lance West and we'll come back to Mercedes. Lance, can you hear me? Yes, I can, I'm right Thank here. Thank you so much. Will you please introduce yourself and tell us professionally and organizationally what inspired you to get involved and what your involvement is now in our community? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I've been a, uh, in education, all in, this will be my 20th year coming up. And I've, uh, I was a high school business teacher and I went in and got my administrative degree and I am now a principal for uh, elementary school in, in the middle of Nevada. So if you've ever driven from Vegas to Shures, um, you've probably driven by our school if you took taken 95. So um, I'm one of only two, and this is, um, you can actually verify this. There are only two American Indian identified uh, through 12 administrators in the entire state of Nevada. And that statistic is just does not is not representative of our population of American Indian Indians in Nevada, for one. And two, in my time in education, it's all been in public schools. Uh, I've worked in uh, urban and rural settings. And in my experience, uh, school districts around Nevada, uh, urban and rural, um, have failed our uh, children of color, and particularly our, our students who reside on um, tribal lands, um, whether it be McDermott uh, up in Humboldt County or um, uh, Walker uh, Shures students that I serve on the Walker River Reservation. So um, there's really a voice that had been lacking and, and just, I guess, empathy in general. So really part of me and Mercedes uh, creating our nonprofit Indigenous Educators Empowerment and headquartering in Vegas uh, two years ago was to uh, bring that voice um, and not cater to uh, our state or federal uh, representatives who um, are whose job it is to speak and on our behalf when it comes to education issues that impact our communities, tribal communities. So uh, really it's just uh, us uh, getting tired of, or just tired of waiting 
for real change to happen. Talk, 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 right? And so we, Mercedes and I, and a number of other uh, um, educators, uh, we decided to take it on ourselves and form this nonprofit. So uh, our purpose down in Las Vegas is the same across Nevada, and that's to help address and um, bring awareness to and seek change, systemic change uh, to um, Native American students um, everywhere. So um, yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lance. That's great. And is Mercedes able to chime in now? Can you hear me, Mercedes? She says she can hear, but um, is there anything you have to do on your end to unmute her? Because she's on her phone and not on Zoom. Let's see. Uh, you know, I could give her my phone. How's that? Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, okay. On our side. Okay, can you hear us? I can, yes. All right. Thank you so much for your patience. And yeah, just chiming into the story, um, I'll bring it back to two experiences that I had uh, within a couple months of each other. The first one was um, being in a grade level meeting with other educators in my grade level and trying to share with them, you know, not trying to take over the curriculum. I, I, was sharing with them some balance that needed to be given to an upcoming lesson. So I found some information um, that countered the actually false narrative that, uh, you know, the textbook that we were using had on Lewis and Clark. And I actually ended up leaving that meeting crying, <laughs> you know, being a 40 year old woman crying in my classroom after a meeting with my peers, after feeling uh, embarrassed and unheard and you know knowing that the information that I was sharing was from research and truth and and being ignored and pushed away in that way and then so that's the experience as a teacher and then uh, I happened to be on the superintendent's advisory cabinet for Nevada Department of Education that year and I was at an education hearing in um in our Capitol building. And as I was looking through the report, I noticed number one, that on the report, it showed that Native American students had the least amount of emotional security in Nevada schools um, out of any of the groups of students. And all of those other measures, it was either black or native students who were the lowest in school safety measures. Going forward into reading that report, um, it showed the student achievement supposed to be of all students in fourth and eighth grade, but you know the same erasure that I was having with the curriculum in my classroom was on that report and it listed all groups of students except for there was not Native American students even listed not even listed with an asterisk, it was a complete erasure, like our group of students did not exist. So those two moments, and then, you know, uh, a chance re-meeting with Lance, and, you know, just those conversations. So I've had them with you, Adrian, <laughs> where we just go on and on, and, and there's just so much energy to them. Um, that's, you know, that's my, my story of how Indigenous Educators Empowerment was born. And, you know, the other work that I've been doing, I, I'm privileged to serve as a commissioner on the Nevada Minority Affairs Commission, and I, I currently chair the Education Committee. I'm on the board of the ACLU Nevada, um, Nevada State Education Association, and I'm involved in uh, organizations, um, mostly Indigenous focused, but, uh, you know, all of them having to do with visibility for all students and correct curriculum and history and you know safe environment for all of our students so that's a little bit about me and i, I want to you know end there thanking you so much for uh, including us in your conversation today i really appreciate you yes you're absolutely welcome thank you for that uh detail and background and i do want to add at this time we had planned for a few other community members and six months ago when we Adrian, planned, you're muted Mm. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we can I hear can you. hear you. 
Yeah. Okay, great. Because my mic says unmuted. Um, please drop it in the chat if you're having any problem hearing me. But I just want to say six months ago when we planned this panel, uh, we weren't planning to run into election day. So there's been a lot of craziness around this. Um, and, and then, well, of course, we have the pandemic and COVID going on. So today we won't have Yusuf Wyatt, who was planned to be a guest on the panel. But we do, I'm glad to say, have some special guests that have joined us in the audience. So um, as we open this up, we really want to just move this into a discussion so that we can understand as a community what the illusion of inclusion is. And I see here, I'm having some internet issues. It's telling me some unstable issues. So let me know if you can't hear me. But um, we want to tie this into the illusion of inclusion, what that means, and how systemic racism plays a part in a lot of the plights that we face as people of color, and how that has sparked a positive movement, Black joy. And so that's the trail that we're gonna lead into this and what you as community members can take away from this and do to make an impact in this community on such a big cause. So the illusion of inclusion, I got the example that it's kind of like, say you're making a cake and you have the ingredients for the cake and then you need the energy of what it takes to make that cake. And that's where we put them together. And that's where the illusion comes in. The subtle ways in which we're calling diversity, let's hire our three, right? We've heard even some of our former presidents refer to it as my black, I've got my one, I've got my two. And we're merging in people of color, but we're not really applying what it takes to really diversify our system. We're asking people of color to come and assimilate um, speak in a different tone, deny culture, um, we don't have proper representation. So all of this starts to build on the illusion of inclusion. So what I want to move into now is to see how, from the lenses of community members, your experience with in your fields, how the illusion of inclusion has affected you, and also from a systemic race, racially position of how it affects us as a community. I want to ask Monique specifically about this. It'll tie into with Janet because we talk about health equity a lot. Health equity and how it's pretty much like a ball that just one issue connects with the next issue. So if, Monique, if you'll open up about, about how the environmental climate justice, you had a recent um, experience with that and how that applies to health. And then I wanna move that into Janet explaining why she advocates so fiercely about health equity, if you will. Yeah, so um, I will say, I guess I can talk on, on two parts also as a, as a therapist, <laughs> um, you know, but when it comes to um, environmental issues, you know, I think for the most part, at least, personally, what I see on TV are, you know, like white people talking about the climate change, right? Like, you know, that that's it. And um, oftentimes the issues when it comes to environment um, that affect folks of color um, just get completely, you know, we, we just don't hear about that. Um, one of the things I was sharing with Adrian um, this week was, um, you know, just mining. I've learned so much since I've um, been working with Great Basin Resource Watch and going out to um, directly impacted communities. And, and I mean, some of that work I was doing when I um, worked with PLAN, but um, it's, it's just been so, every time I go out and I talk to people, um, and a lot of um, folks are native, right, that have been, you know, um, directly impacted. Um, and recently going to Las Vegas, you know, I was able to talk to even my own family members, which I didn't even know um, that used to work at the Nevada test site. Um, and a lot of those folks are black, you know, um, black folks who have gotten cancer, you know, from these chemicals and um, other things that, you know, toxins that they've had to work with. Another great example um, of that is um, Black children have the highest rate of asthma in our country. 
Um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it's not just because we have weak lungs or something. Um, a lot of um, a lot of black communities um, are next to plants, um, power plants, um, or not power plants, but factories. Um, and we are breathing in, you know, all of these things that are in the air. And so when we talk about environmental issues and health disparities, they're directly connected. Um, the other way I see that um, in my line of work um, outside of the environmental um, is, uh, you know, getting the same kind of equal care within therapy, right? Um, I wholly believe, which is why I'm in this work, um, is that everyone who wants um, to have any form of mental health care should be able to access that. It should be accessible. Um, but numbers have shown that, um, you know, you have higher, higher rates of um, getting care that um, treatment that um, will, will, what's the word I'm thinking? I'm sorry, my brain's like getting off of my job and I'm like somewhere else in my head. Um, but your treatment will basically fare um, better if your therapist is someone that comes from a similar cultural background than yourself, right? Um, because then you feel more comfortable. I mean, just a lot of other things go into that. Yeah. But um, for those of us who are folks of color, um, especially living here in Northern Nevada, that is extremely hard to find sometimes, you know, trying to find a therapist. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, race. You know, I've had some people who identify as LGBTQ um, identify in that community, and it's been difficult for them to find someone. Or um, if they do happen to find someone, right, it's really expensive and um, not having the money or, or the type of insurance um, to be able to access it. So um, I think for me, those are the ways that I've seen um, how that can be an issue um, with, yeah. with both of those areas. I don't want to talk It's actually that. pretty interesting that you say that because as you start to talk about it and some of the conversations that Mercedes and I uh, have had, tie into that. And I know I mentioned Janet, but as you speak on it, I just want to pull Mercedes in a bit because we talked about uh, the mines and the indigenous community. And then I'm going to leave Janet next, just make a little change because Janet really goes into health equity for people of color and why that matters. So just before Janet goes in, Mercedes, can I pull you into that this discussion with Monique about what you're seeing in the indigenous communities? or Lance? All right, and so we're wait, wait. Okay, I'm here, I'm You're sorry. There. I heard Mercedes, Mercedes and I was gonna hand my phone to her, but she's okay. like, okay, you could take, I'll take this one. Sure. Can you restate that again? Sure, I know you both are partners. And with this question, we're talking about health equity in our communities and talking about how these issues pretty much link in one into the other. And just to make it very plain and clear, I recognize we have black representation and indigenous and I've invited some of our friends out that are on the line of special guests that are from the Latino community. There's AAPI issues. Some of these may be a little different in each of our communities, but they're very similar. And that's why I wanna tie uh, Monique in with Lance and then take it over to Janet. Can you tell us about how these, the disparities are affecting the indigenous community when it comes to environmental climate, health, um, and health coverage, the inequities that are involved, and then we're gonna patch it over to Janet. Oh, absolutely. Well, in terms of um, the health, health inequities that exist uh, with the pandemic, um, uh, uh, mental health, Especially with their young ones and all of our, all of our um, folks uh, experiencing trauma from loss and uh, everything else that came with uh, the pandemic, um, it really highlighted just how much our our rural communities are lacking resources, our rural tribal communities. So, as you guys all know, um, virtual meetings, what we're doing right now, that all these all this technology and software uh, came out. However, uh, and then they were doing, um, you know, um, teledoc, right? But uh, many of our rural communities, particularly 
up at Duck Valley Indian Reservation, which is the Owyhee um, uh, Paiute Shoshone Res Reservation, they have very poor internet infrastructure. Uh, so there was just huge sections of our our tribal communities that have just what we have one maybe one contracted uh, psychologist or psychiatrist and serving um, not only that community but multiple communities and traveling so the mental health was just it just what little resource we have and the same too with all of this money that these various gov tribal governments receive through cares and then through the um biden act the arpa money um there was simply not enough for the priority of mental health and uh, was just so low on the list. Some communities though did use their funding to begin construction of, of really outdated uh, uh, buildings and as well as being able to contract out further. But, but still, it just seemed like that was so low. That was, it should be number one if it could be. And so again, Really, when I would go to these gatherings and then they would talk about mental health and what kind of services are being provided, there's some organization in Las Vegas who, when asked about rural communities, they did reference telemedicine. And when pressed about these issues I expressed, they simply had no answer. And I'm afraid they had that, that still the medical professionals, health professionals, and as well as tribal government leaders right. and everyone in between don't have quite the answer yet because it was already rough before the pandemic. Right. Now it's even more difficult. So in that regard, yes, in terms of environment, um, we have a couple of, we have uh, that lithium mine that's proposed up in uh, Northern Nevada. And uh, just, just discussions that talk about uh, uh, using mining as a source of revenue in a lot of these our communities where the, our economic, we don't have any economy. We don't have any strong, um, solid income coming in on a regular basis. So with the mines coming in and, and, and wanting to uh, drill into our land, that, that does cause a lot of concern, future concern for those communities that do eventually give in or, or, or they do, they are able to, uh, mine lithium up there in northern northeast nevada northwest nevada and they come after all the other lands i mean it's just everything is just so uh we have to have fighters we have to have folks who can articulate who can speak to this and who can advocate and uh that's part of us being involved with these issues and being with other other organizations is kind of our, our our push right to get the get the word out and get get folks to do what we've always done and what uh, other communities of color have done for hundreds of years, which is survive. We serve by survive how? By fighting, standing our ground. So. Yes, and Senator Warnock made a statement just last night I saw on TV. God will make a way out of no way, you know, and that's people of color have been latching on to faith for a very long time to get through a lot of these issues. Today, you mentioned a good point, Lance, is us connecting the dots together to, be, to make a bigger impact. And Janet, um, can you tie us into the health inequity and how this snowballs? Yes, thank you, um, Adrian. Um, I'm listening to the conversations and um, what I hear and, and um, um, through all of what was said is, um, is pretty paramount to why, why we do in the NAACP what we do in terms of addressing health disparities and calling out the need to eliminate health disparities from a systemic um, perspective and not just looking at health disparities from a, a, a lens of health. Not everyone in our community has been, not everyone in this um, in in the United States is benefiting equally from health. That's why we have health inequities. Um, inequities, um, health disparities is not a new term. We have had these health issues for years and years and years, um, centuries actually, um, and we have not ever um, addressed the systemic need for change from a social justice lens. And what I wanted to talk about, give me a minute, is the social and economic factors and racism that leads to these poor health outcomes. 
the, um, not only for Black Americans, but for Native Americans and other um, minorities, um, including those um, uh, people of color with disabilities. So throughout this coronavirus pandemic, what, what has been underscored is the importance for uh, a need for a healthy nation across um, racial lines, across um, 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 economic lines. We have um, some very serious problems in the Black community and other communities of color. In this country, Native American women um, 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 and African American women are dying from childbirth. They're dying from maternal, maternal morbidity is a real issue in the Native American and African American community. This is not a new issue. It was an issue when I was doing policy and program development as a health program specialist for the Division of Public and Behavioral Health back in 20, 10, 2009. So these are not new issues, but we're having black and brown women dying because of, and they're not poor. They're not women of low socioeconomic status. Some of these women, um, one in particular that is well known as a doctor, dying from giving birth to a child and our infant mortality rate also is influenced by that. So I'm looking at, um, under, we need to underscore and we need to find solutions that address the socioeconomic factors that impact health. We know that housing and, and health are intrinsically linked. We know that environment and health are intrinsically linked, yet we have seen no proposals until the pandemic that truly address what's going on in our communities. Um, Lung cancer is very prevalent in the African American community. Lung cancer is the leading cause of death among African American men. We know we talked a little bit about um, 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 asthma. I think Monique talked, spoke to asthma and the mental health needs. We are being traumatized just for living as people of color in this nation, and it's not okay. So we need to change the, um, shift the conversation to more of a, a systemic conversation on what is wrong with these systems? Why aren't we making the impact we need to make to have better outcomes among people of color? That's what health equity is, that everyone gets the same level of care, the same level of provision of services, but but they're administered based on the community's needs and wants for that community. It can't be one size fits all, which is pretty much the pattern we have. Black Americans here in the United States um, during the COVID-19 pandemic made up uh, the highest, one of the highest percentage of diagnosed COVID in the states. Um, and broken, when you break that down by race and ethnicity, over 34% of African Americans died, deaths were due to COVID, even though we only make up 13% of the population nationwide. So the NAACP and other organizations who address health, um, eliminating health disparities are looking at policies and programs that are community driven approaches to reducing stigma and reaching disparate populations rather than uh, government driven policies and programs. Um, I wanted to talk a minute about, um, again, about um, Black mental health. Um, Monique brought that up, and this is important. I think that we stress that our children in communities of color, one thing that's happened as a result of COVID is our young people, our, our young children are committing suicide at enormously high rates in communities of color. It's, a, it's an epidemic, and we are not addressing the mental health needs of Black, Brown, communities or of indigenous needs of communities. And when Monique speaks to um, adding on top of this, people who are people of color with disabilities, with who are LGBT, it just amplifies the problem. 
um, but we are not addressing the problem through an equity lens and, lens, and we're not addressing the problem through a social justice lens, and that needs to happen. In addition, I want to also mention, I'm a little concerned about this funding that's coming out um, of COVID that goes, that's coming into the communities to address inclusion and diversity, because those are really nice terms. But if you're going to talk about inclusion and diversity, you need to talk about getting that money to where the where it's needed most in those communities of color. I think Lance spoke a lot about the systems piece of that. And I know that Mercedes speaks to this all the time. We have to get, we have to, we're outrage. We have to get our communities educated and outrage too, because change doesn't happen in a vacuum. Change, change normally doesn't happen unless there's agitation. When people are upset, that's when we see the most change. So we need to get upset. We need to get mad. We need to get angry. We need to start calling people out for what for these systems that exist. We need to be calling each other out for allowing these systems, those people um, that represent us as people of color, we need to be calling them out and saying, hey, what's going on here? If you're speaking for yourself, you're not speaking for us, Adrian. You spoke to the fact of illusion, this illusion of inclusion, which actually came out of the social justice work through plan. I think Angela Lesby, um, who we used to work with in the People of Color Caucus, first brought that term to light. Um, it's everything looks good on paper, everything looks good in policy, but it's not make if it's not changing anything, it's not working. Right. So we need to look at how to make these systems work and make ourselves and other people accountable for what's happening because people are dying. This is not a matter of of small changes. People are literally dying because of these inequities in our system. Absolutely. So please keep that in mind because we'll be talking about how our community can participate in making an impact. But before we do that, I also want to announce to everyone who's joined us, this is a discussion. So if you'd like to join the discussion, please feel free to prompt your hand signal and we'll invite you in, especially those communities that are not on the panel, meaning the representation for those communities are Latino, Latinx community, the LGBTQ community, um, AAPI. Please feel free to raise your hand and uh, participate as this is a discussion. Also, I wanna say our allies. We have a lot of allies out in the community going hard, you know, and um, I wanna acknowledge that. So um, I want to actually invite some of our guest panelists. Uh, before I move into that, I want to ask Lance or Mercedes, do you want to chime in on, on this discussion at this point? If you can hear me, your milk is your, if you're talking, your mute mic is muted. And I, I know that with the election day, um, I don't know if I mentioned it in the beginning, but Mercedes might have to drop off a bit early, Lance and Mercedes, for campaign reasons. Um, but I want to move over to a special guest here today, uh, Camila Bywaters, who's doing a lot of work in Clark County, Nevada. Cam Camila, will you introduce yourself and tell us about your work in advocacy? and how uh, the illusion of inclusion has been a part of what you're doing and system. Yes. Thank you so much for um, inviting me today. I really feel honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, for the sake of time, I won't take up too much time. Again, my name is Camila Bywaters. I'm the president of the Las Vegas Alliance of Black School Educators. And also my vice president is on as well, Tracy Lewis. And the mission of our organization is to enhance and facilitate educational opportunities and the social development of all students, but we are especially interested in um, supporting our underrepresented and underserved Black and African American children. Um, one illusion of inclusion that really keeps us motivated and focused on the work that we do is the fact that we have AB 234, which was the um, enactment and provisions related to multicultural education, which was a bill to introduce multicultural education into our school systems, but however, it is not being fully implemented. Um, this bill was led by Assemblyman Harvey Mumford, who um, truly has a passion for um, multicultural education. So a lot of our work is around advocacy, and we will start pushing on um, this um, curriculum focus in, in our schools. Um, it is very problematic. Um, in 2017, the Office of Civil Rights 
um, gave some data that said that 41.7% of black students were expelled from school. This number is like to planet Pluto because we know that only um, about our population of black students is about 14%. So that number far exceeds the amount of black students who are registered in our school. And this issue does not only um, impact black students, we also see Hispanic students um, suffer from the same type of injustice and um, the overrepresentation and disproportionality of expulsions that happen in our school. And I did hear, um, one of our friends talked about erasure. And one of our topics now um, with the school, with the Clark County School District and educational um, systems within our state is the erasure of black men and women. And um, we fight hard for that. And one of our um, mottos, uh, we are guided. I I'm, I'm a quotesy person. So give me a good quote and I'll just like melt. Um, but one of our favorite quotes by Leela Watson, if you have come here to help us, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with ours, then let us work together. And that really guides the spirit of the work of Levapsi and how we um, um, uh, move forward in our society. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. I want to reach out to our other special guests and those who have joined us here today, um, getting a couple messages. Is there anyone that is joined today that wants to contribute to this discussion at this point? Or has any questions? We'll also take some questions at this point. Any clarifying questions? And then we'll move into how we can make an impact. Well, as we, um, we will at the end of the week put some references and resources up on our website that those who have joined here today will be able to reach out to members who were on this call, uh, organizations, reads, uh, events that are coming up. But we wanna also talk about, um, I know that some of the topics we have not talked about is our Latino community and AAPI community that much. So I definitely want to welcome if there's anyone on the call that wants to contribute, feel free to raise your hand and jump on in and join this conversation. Uh, one other area of conversation I want to discuss is wealth, generational wealth and generational poverty, um, which has been affected which has affected wealth building in our community. So I want to ask Verita uh, Pro Black Prothro. Are you here on the line with us? Yes, I'm here. I just wondered if can I know. Me? Yeah, I can hear you. And I know you've been really active in the community politically, also as an engaged community member. Your family's been in this community for a very long time. I wanted to get some of your feedback from your experience, from your lens, when it comes to generational wealth and redlining specifically. Well, um, my, my father moved here in 1947. And I believe he bought his first property here in 1953, but he was only allowed to, to buy property in Northeast Reno. He wasn't um, allowed to, because he's, he was um, black, to purchase property in like Southwest Reno or Northwest Reno. So um, from 1953 to now, you can see how, how significantly that impacts our family's wealth because the property values in those areas of town is still by far at least 50% more than most of the property in Northeast Reno. And so that's not something of, you know, way back then or, um, that doesn't impact people now. And that I think that's part of what a lot of people who are not black or Latino don't understand. Um, even with the GI Bill that was meant for um, veterans to come home 
and um, purchase property, very few black GIs were, it, were afforded that opportunity. They just weren't able to get, they just didn't give them the loans. And so they um, had to either not buy property or buy property that was valued at a much lesser value. And again, that still impacts decades later, family wealth. Are you still there? Yes, I am. You're absolutely right. So when we talk okay. about some communities are saying like, well, why can't you just pull yourself up? You have all the access that I have. Nobody's shorting you. There's no, it's an imagination. Sky's the limit. It's all about your community, your work. And if you stop killing each other. Yeah. And that's can... not, yes. and that's not true. I mean, both Wells Fargo and Bank of America have been sued within the last five years for not giving loans to black people. I mean, so it, they still continue to do the same things. They just hope they don't get caught. Exactly. So, and, and I want to start just getting a so, bit. Um, That's you know, and, and I'm not sure if it's that they don't think that, that, the, that Black and Latino people can pay or they don't want them to have something nice. I'm not sure which, or both, or a combination of both. But there's something really sinister about it. It's, and it's not an accident. You know, people always say, oh, well, you're just being so sensitive. And it was probably just an accident. No, it wasn't an accident. If it happens all the time, it's not an accident. Yes. And I see Janet Serio's hand up. So I want to acknowledge that. Janet, do you want to chime in on this conversation? Yes, I do, because I think this is a very important conversation because wealth building falls across everything in terms of from an economic perspective, through education, through health. Um, and when you're addressing poverty and or why we haven't pulled ourselves, as you said, um, Adrian, up by our bootstraps, we have historical, historically, that if each time we've tried to pull ourselves up, we have examples we, we, um, uh, of times in history where we've done that. We've always been brought back down. So what I wanna talk about is wealth building. It has to encompass every area and every aspect of, of our systems. If it doesn't, it's not gonna help because the educational system, if we don't have young people in, in positions where they are making money so they can build wealth, i.e., you know, they have to make enough to be able to buy a home, enough to be able to become an entrepreneur. Those are things you have to have um, funding for. And if funding is not being given, given to these communities who need it most, i.e., the small business loans, we have a lot of organizations that are working. Can just speak on this? Hello? Sorry about that. Keep going, Janet. We muted them. Okay, so we have a lot of organizations like, like our Urban League, like the NAACP, who are looking at how do we look at these systems and build, build change, transform those systems to build wealth. Because right now what we have, again, is that we have a crisis in our educational system, and Camilla can speak to that, where we have young people who can't go to college because they can't afford it. And we have young people who will not even and look at college as an option because they see their peers, their family members, et cetera, et cetera, struggling with student debt they cannot pay off. So we are really in an educational economic crisis in the African-American community around wealth building because you can't build wealth without money, without capital. So you have to have capital. So we, again, we may need, we need to look and see how the systems we currently have what can we do to transform those systems to make them work better for the people like us who need them most? Because again, um, I'm, I'm really scared that our young people are heading in the opposite direction, that they're going to be those people who are not going to be the decision makers because they're not going to be able to make those influential decisions working at Burger King, working at um, Target. 
they're not going to be able to influence those changes from those positions. They need to be in positions of power and building capital. That's important in wealth building, building capital. We all know that home ownership is probably the most important way to build capital right now, although um, um, we don't see as many homeowners in, um, in, in, in Northern Nevada um, in certain areas of our community. You can count the areas where you see people of color open, own, owning homes in both Las Vegas and in Northern Nevada. So that's all I have to say. And speaking of homes, you know, we know with the bubble that burst, just this uncertain, I'm going to go to Mylan and then Camila, uh, but like who mentioned it? Oh, Verita. Verita mentioned that, you know, Wells Fargo and B of A um, were sued for these practices, you know, so it's only when it's brought to light. And even then you still have to deal with um, those that no matter what evidence you show them that this is happening, they'll deny it. So we, and after we go with Mylan and Camila in last comments, we want to move into what can we do to make an impact? How do we start to thread the solution together to make an impact to this very large, enormous, it seems, system? Uh, Mylan, would you like to chime in the discussion? Yes, thank you very, very much. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Janet uh, when she was with the state uh, on a number of healthcare issues and uh, community disparities. I'd like to say that we made tremendous inroads. Well, we made some inroads. And when we come to addressing the ills for people of color throughout the state, we are still sadly lacking in education, in healthcare, in affordable housing, and in the very infrastructure that we need to create a holistic community. And this not only comes to what Janet and I worked on as access to care public policy, it comes down to public policy. And as from my perspective, and you can tell me to go home, it is where we need to change the public policy at a community level, at a county level, and at a state level. And that requires a form of activism that I have not seen organized here. If we can do that, we change the community public policy. Where are my parks? Where is my clinic? What is in my school? Those are the things that we need. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be, oh, our kids can't read that book. Our kids right. need a playground. Absolutely. Understand what I'm talking about. It is organizing to create the public policy. And I'll keep my mouth shut now. So thank you for sharing that, Mylan. So when you say a form of activism you have not seen here, um, yeah, we talk about it, but how do we get the troops down to City Hall? How do we get the troops to the school board? We see a lot of crazies go to the school board, but who's going to the school board to talk about what our kids need on a daily basis? When it comes to getting a clinic into the community, who's going to the county health department and beating on the doors. Mm -hmm. It really takes that kind of activism. And there are people in this community, Janet being one of them, Patricia Gilmore I see here being another one, Mario's another one. I mean, we got a lot of people that know how to do this. But when I say you need people to go, it isn't just Janet or Pat or Mario or anybody who's here this evening walking in alone. 
That's right. You That's need to create what I call the tsunami of activism. And then all of a sudden people go, oh, well, I won't get elected if I don't start. And that's how you change public policy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, Lance, you know, that's part of what Lance said had inspired he and Mercedes. Lance, are you still on with us? I know that they may have to drop off early for campaign reasons, but I think I still see Lance's name. Um, if you can hear me, we can't hear you. Please chime in and unmute. Mario, Mario's come down and supported uh, me when I was advocating for the school naming. I'll just add my two cents that it's part of what inspired me to be involved is we went towards the school naming. It's a whole policy. The process was reversed, changed, and was not upheld. And that I had a problem with. And you're right, we need troops because you can't do it by yourself. You need your community when you when you all hear that these things are going on, latch on, find out like you joined today. Thank you so much for that. But latch on and see how you can support that person uh, trying to push back because it's so it's it feels so big sometimes that it makes you just want to say whatever. And I just want to add that I was out. I'm a precinct captain. I was out in the community and there was a neighbor who said he had lived there 50 years, primate, first language, Spanish speaking, uh, lived there 50 years. He said he doesn't vote because it doesn't matter. They're going to do what they want to do anyways, he said. And in my heart, that hurts because it's like this is a person who is own. They own their home. Their home looks good. They take great care of their home. They're working two jobs. They're raising kids in our community and they don't feel like they have a voice in our community. So we can't just represent, uh, elect people who say that they will represent us, but elect people who do actually speak for us, not just use our voice to get momentum. And then when they get that seat, you don't hear from them about our issues. That I feel like is something we have to change in our community. And I'm not gonna take up too much space, but I wanna acknowledge and then move, in, move to Camila. Dela says, there's a very real history of BIPOC communities, especially black communities being attacked, murdered, terrorized whenever there are financial uh wherever there was financial success absolutely i encourage you all to read a bit about towns and cities that were basically covered with water uh over a hundred communities bombed and destroyed of black progressive communities a lot of these things i didn't even learn about myself until being coming an adult so there's just a lot out there that is not in our mainstream education system and it takes an extra effort to learn about them. But I wanna to move to Camila, we've got a couple hands. I also wanna say we're hitting the seven o'clock hour. So I wanna respect everyone's time that has joined. If you're able to stick around with us for a little while longer, let's try to mix into the solution when we cover the next few hands. And um, in the next week, we're gonna drop some resources on our Northern Nevada Marches Forward website of good reads, how to be good allies. Go back into, if you're on this call and you're not of color, go back into your white circles, start there, have the conversations there. Don't just hug your black friends and tell them how much you care, but go back to your churches, go back to your communities where they don't have black friends and tell them, how they can make an impact. Have them sign on to these bills that we're advocating. Some believe in the reparations, read about it. See why it is a matter of uh, restorative justice in our community. Why it isn't just about, hey, you have every opportunity I have. Actually, that's not the case. And studies show that that's not the case. Um, I wanna move to Camila because with this issue, there's so much we can cover that we're gonna to try to cover the, the community members who have something to say, move into a solution and see what's left there. Camila, you got the mic. Thank you so much. Um, I really just wanted to, really echoing off my friend who just finished, she pretty much took the words out of my mouth. Um, white supremacist culture has defined and continues to uphold our systems. And the only way that we can change those systems is to call out the madness, the drama, the ignorance that we hear our leaders uphold. And as a person um, who attends um, as many school board meetings as I can, I've literally gone from, ugh, I don't wanna attend a meeting to now, it is a part of my schedule, like my J-O-B. 
<laughs> and I probably, if I would focus on something else, I could be like a millionaire, but it, because I just got into the practice of going and speaking up to the things that are not making sense, that are lies and just disruptive to building up our communities, um, we as a community have to move out of like um, my friend just said, we have to move out of our close knit circles and really begin to mobilize ourselves and hold our leaders accountable and attend the meetings where these conversations are happening and where decisions are being made without our voice. So prime example, the last um, school board meeting here in Clark County School District, um, the community did not want a particular person to be on a committee. And because um, the community said, hey, this is a conflict of interest, this is not gonna work. That person was not on the committee. If those voices would have never spoken up, they probably would have moved on forward and had this individual on the community, on the um, committee, can't even speak, on the um, committee. But I say that to say that we have to have the courage and to call out these oppressive systems and then to also mobilize our communities to help us to do the same. And if we are not able to speak out because it is fearful and it, it, it's a sacrifice, then support the people who are doing that work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Camila. I'm gonna move to uh, Ms. Pat Gallimore. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for uh, doing this, appreciate this. Um, you know, Go, going back in, ter in terms of what people were stating, you know, how did we get the people involved? I think it was Mylan actually. You know, civil rights and standing up for right, what's right and standing up for what is not the popular thing to do is very, very difficult. And for people of color, color especially African-Americans, we love, I'll just put it to you straight, we like to have fun. We don't like to cause waves part of is, is part of our generational type thing from slavery. When we spoke up and we did what was right and what we should do, we were killed. We got lynched. We got killed. And it's still happening today. But I say to you and I say to folks, don't be afraid. You know, my, my saying has always been infiltrate from within, which that means is if you don't have a seat at the table, you know, what do they say if you're not on the well, something you're on the menu or something, but you have to infiltrate for within. You have to get on these committees. You have to get on these boards. You have to go down to assembly. You know, sometimes when you're taking that personal day off, you might need to go down to uh, assembly. You might need to go down to city hall. Make these people know who you are. Because I kid you not, when I, if I walk into city hall and my husband walks into city hall, they're like, oh my God, they'll, they'll, they'll send the one black person that's there to come say, what is the NACP doing there? What, what's, what, what, what's going on? They want to know. So it does actually mean something when you're doing something. Okay. We just went to a faith-based breakfast that the sheriff and the police department were putting on. It means you have to put in the time and, and it, it's hard. It, 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 it's, it's hard. It's, it takes dedication. I grab my, I don't ask any, anything of anyone else. And I ask it myself. I grab my, I grab my grandkids, my children, they all have to come back and go do the same thing. Um, my kids, um, they go on to college, they come back to this community, but that's because my husband and myself, we tell them, hey, this, this is your community. This is where you live. This is what we need to do to change it. And, and so that's part of it, but we have to advocate that for our youth that are going up in school. You know, as I said, I got kids that went to Verdi Elementary, my friend to Verdi. As soon as they see Pat Gallimore walk on the campus, the principal's coming out, hi, Mrs. Gallimore, is there something I can help you? But if you don't make any waves, you don't see anything. So what I'm saying is it's, it's hard. It's not the comfortable thing to do. It's not fun. It's not partying. It's serious work. But if we don't do it, who's gonna, we can't look for other people to do it. And also I just wanna digress to one other thing and I'm gonna get off. Uh, Lonnie Feimster has a very, very good, um, I wanna say a workshop on building generational wealth. And he will talk, he talks about how in the 60s and the 70s and 40s and 50s that we own more homes than what we own now. And, and it's just like Verita was saying, this is not something that just happened by, by happenstance. This is by design. Okay, this is all by design in terms of keeping us from moving up. And then there's another thing. Um, uh, guys, it was something that I was reading in an article. It's going to take us 450 something odd years, and I'm talking African American people, for us to be anywhere near what, what, where our white counterparts are in terms of that's how far that we are lacking behind. 
And I'll just leave it at that. That's food for thought. You can Google that and it might come up with even more, but it's, it will tell you it was actually a study that was done based on how far we are lagging behind economically. Yeah, that is a- uh, Thanks for being. You're welcome. Thank you for that, Pat Gallimore. I wanna uh, acknowledge Janet Serio at this time. And if there aren't any other um, discussion comments from the board, just wanna get some feedback from our panel of how our community members can make help make an impact. Janet Serial, do you want to message in on the discussion? Yes, I do. I do have a, some final words. We, uh, our ongoing systems of oppression are at the root of all of our social inequities. That is a fact. Ongoing systems of oppression are at the root of our social inequities. If we do not deal with the problem, we don't solve the problem. We have to address these systems and the oppression that's caused by the ineffectiveness of the systems. We, mu we ha must work toward the redistribution of money, power, and resources at the national, at the state, and the local levels to advance strategies that increase diversity in all of our social systems, whether that be healthcare, education, economic development, criminal justice system, et cetera. As Mylan pointed out, we, we know how to mobilize we need to mobilize. You, there, there is no action that can be accomplished on by one or two people alone. It takes people incentivizing and mo mobilizing other people to action. Whether you're Rosa Parks on the bus or you have to get other people to act. If you're the only one doing it and nothing is happening, we need to go back and say, well, that's not really working for us <laughs> because we're, we're not making the dip we have to educate ourselves, educate our communities. We have to really, you know, I'm a social worker and I'm passionate about old time social work, boots on, you know, pounding the pavements. We don't do that enough. And I think social media has created um, a, a pattern that has led us to, to, to learn how to do, uh, do um, boots on the ground through social media, but we need to have connections. We need to connect with each other on a per more personal level. And that's what I wanted to say is we can't do any of this without people. So it's nice that we're having this conversation and it's an important conversation to be had. Don't get me wrong, but it's not enough. This should be a first step towards something better, something greater. So let's take this as an opportunity to build something. We have a lot of good ideas that have been thrown out, but again, ideas are only as good as the follow through. So let's just get to work and get it done. I'm, I'm a little passionate because I'm tired. I'm, I'm getting older. And it's like, okay, I've been talking about this. As Mylan said, we've been doing this work for a long time, but you know, the work doesn't stop with me. It only begins with me. And my charge is to get more people younger people to these tables to do the work. Absolutely. Wow. That's why I love you, Janet. You're amazing. Um, and, and that's something I want to give you the question. I'm going to go to Monique, and then we're going to ask about the solution. We, we have been talking about this for a while, how we need to determine how do we link our organizations locally, statewide, nationally, how we use that as a force to make an impact, right? But I'm gonna to move to Monique for a last uh, closing discussion topic if there are no more hands. And then I just want some feedback on how y'all feel we can ask our community to participate in being a part of the solution. Um, I was trying <laughs> I was trying to find a little hand, I don't know, I can't find it on here. I thought I knew Zoom, I guess I don't. But um, to kind of tag in with what Pat and Janet were saying, um, showing up. I, now that I'm on the other side, you know, with full-time job, I understand now that it's very difficult um, to, to, I mean, a lot of these meetings are being held in the middle of the day, right? And so um, if you're one of those folks who are just like, I, you know, I would love to go, but I just can't, um, you can call your representatives. I just wanted to make note of that. Um, you know, at the legislature, you can, um, you can, you can send them emails, um, you can, write them letters. Um, 
if you are someone who is unable to go physically for whatever reason, there's other ways of reaching people. So I just want you to know, like, um, kind of what Janet was saying, you know, everyone can have a hand in this. So don't feel like um, you can't do anything because you can't be in there in person. So that was my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. That's absolutely right. And um, we want to start the thread through Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada together. Um, but before we close out this discussion, you know, Adrian, can I say one, one thing too? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. We also have to make sure that people vote. I mean, there are the numbers of people who do not vote is still just ridiculous. We need everybody who can vote should vote. And we need to really make sure that we have, you know, um, a push on that. Lonnie's been good for years in working on get out the vote. We need to help him. He needs help. He can't do it all by himself. Um, and at every event, you know, that there is, we need to be out there encouraging people to vote. Because if, if we get some of these people in office who have said that they don't agree with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, they've said that out loud, hmm. you know, then we could be right back where we were in the 50s. And that's not hyperbole. I mean, this is what they are saying. So we have to be vigilant in making sure that people vote, um, that they do everything that they need to do to make sure that they're um, you know, on the roll and that their vote is counted. And that is just absolutely no joke. We need to start today's primary day, do whatever you have to do to get ready to vote. Um, and the midterms in November. So anyway, that's my my piece there. That was a great piece, Farida, because it's absolutely true. For some of our counterparts in the community that have been disenfranchised, please remind them that we get it, we understand, but without a vote to put those in the seats, how are we going to affect policy change? So we're working on a macro and a micro level and mm -hmm. just can't give up. So please continue to talk with those in the community that do feel disenfranchised. Um, encourage them not to give up, still vote, support those that are putting in heavy duty work like those on this panel today. Mercedes Krause is heavily working for the indigenous, for actually all students of color. Uh, Lance West, Monique Norman, Janet Serio, um, Verita, you've been busy, Pat's been busy. Actually, there's a lot of people on this call. Um, I see Mario De La Rosa is on the call who has, um, let, I think it's Aura now, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, uh, journal communications. We need to work on continuing to get the message out and message out to our community about what we're doing. Camila, I mean, there's just a lot of people on this call that are very busy working in the community. So I hope that we'll continue to support each other. Speaking of support, so this weekend, there's a Juneteenth festival. Uh, it's June 19th. It looks like it starts at 12 noon and runs through, actually someone, can you confirm, Monique, can you confirm the time of Juneteenth? Yeah, that's correct. We will be having a concert uh, at the end of it in the park. So um, if y'all wanna stay for that, I'm, I honestly don't know when the concert ends. So um, I was on my side, I was like, is that right? Hold on. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the, that concert uh, is free. Um, we were charging originally, but it is free now. So we would love to see everyone there. There's going to be a children's area. I think we got some animals coming. Um, we got a fire truck, I think, coming. I mean, just all kinds of things. So uh, we'd love to see everyone come out. 
Wonderful. And also I want to let those know, please check in the Northern Nevada Marches Forward website we'll, and join us for the LGBTQ plus ally training July 12th. You can register for that directly on the website. And again, by the end of this week, we'll have some resources for some good reads that can help educate you or uh, peers in our community and resources to those in the community that you can reach out to to become involved if you're not yet involved and also that you can thread your work too. So let's also remember to utilize each other in our work to help propel and forward this movement. And I just want to open up for any last closing thoughts or words. I want to thank you all for coming here today and being a part of this panel discussion. Peace and hair grease, just kidding. Peace and love. Um, keep making a difference in your community and have a great evening. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Adrian, for doing this. This is amazing. I feel like the most useless co-host on the planet. <laughs> thank you. The time goes so fast. You know, this is such a big discussion um, that, you know, one segment of it, just health and equity by itself or education by itself, we can really go deep into. So it is a lot of detail to try to tighten up into one hour, but our main goal is to make sure community is aware of it and how they can participate in being a part, a progressive part of change. And I think that we did that today. <laughs>